Thanks. Now I wanted to do a video talking about a new scientific peer-reviewed paper that has recently come out. It's a paper that supports the Younger Dryas Cosmic Impact Hypothesis, and it was released on March 13th of this year, which is 2019. This paper is significant because of its location, which is the southern tip of South America, whereas most of the Younger Dryas research to this point has occurred in the northern hemisphere. And also because of the picture that it paints of the cataclysm that occurred during the end of the last ice age during the Younger Dryas. Now, if you want to find a copy of this paper, you can find it on nature.com slash scientific reports. You can also find my marked up and highlighted version of this paper that I'm using for this video on my website on unchartedx.com, along with a lot of the references and links that I'll talk about in this video. The paper is titled, Sedimentary Record from Patagonia, Southern Chile Supports Cosmic Impact Triggering of Biomass Burning, Climate Change, and Megafaunal Extinctions at 12.8 thousand years ago. It's a paper that's been put together by a diverse team of scientists that represent many academic disciplines as well as many academic institutions from all around the world. Many of these folks have come from the Comet Research Group, which have been looking into this impact hypothesis but before we get into this paper, I thought it might be worth just briefly trying to recap the Younger Dryas, as briefly as I can do anything, which typically isn't that briefly. But the Younger Dryas was the period right at the end of the last ice age. This was a period of just massive climate disruption. It all occurred roughly around 12,800 to 11,600 years ago. So, you know, a 1200 year period of just massive environmental and climactic disruption. If you prefer our strange religious way of dating based on the birth date of somebody who was most likely a fictional made up character, that is 10,800 to 9,600 BC. It also marks the end of the Pleistocene and the transition into the Holocene era, which is the era we are still in today. And it's been posited that this Younger Dryas event was the extinction event for all of the Pleistocene megafauna. The Pleistocene megafauna, things like woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, we're not talking about dinosaurs and things like that here. It was the massive animals that roamed around North America and that had been living on the planet for millions of years up until this point and only some 12,000 years ago they were all wiped out in a very short period of time. The analogy for the number of species that were wiped out is roughly equivalent to the same amount of large animals that are on the planet today. So everything above about 45 kilograms or 100 pounds, all of those animals that exist today on the planet, that was the equivalent number of species that were wiped out during the Younger Dryas period. And the mainstream explanation for this megafaunal extinction has, up to this point, mostly been the idea of human predation, which is to say that small groups of hunter-gatherers wiped out literally millions, if not billions, of massive, aggressive animals across the Northern Hemisphere. That's a feat that even we in our industrial age haven't really managed to do. It's somewhat ridiculous, uh, and it's, it's just the excuse that we've been reaching for. I'll be discussing the Pleistocene extinctions in greater length in another video. During this period, we know what occurred to the planet from several sources, but most notably, it's the ice core samples that tell us the story of what happened to planet Earth. The ice that exists in places like Greenland and Antarctica has been built up over periods of hundreds of thousands of years, and every year, as the snow gets laid down and gets compressed into ice, it contains a record of what was happening during that year. From these ice core samples, scientists can determine things like temperature, CO2 levels, was there burning, was there all sorts of different uh, chemical indicators that give you an idea of the environmental picture across the planet at the time. We know that there were massive temperature swings during the Younger Dryas. There was some abrupt warming and then a, there was a rapid temperature decline and a drop to full glacial conditions back to a full ice age. And after that period, there was an abrupt shift that brought us back up out of that cold and returned us to this gradual warming path. And in fact, the stable climate that we enjoy to this day. There are also several other indicators of massive climactic shifts and environmental catastrophes that occurred during this period. One of those is the massive sea level rises that occurred, meltwater pulses 1A and 1B. Those are also timed around the Younger Dryas time frame. And they must have been driven by the very rapid melting of the continental ice sheets that covered most of the Northern Hemisphere. There's actually a paradox here called the energy paradox it's the idea that there really wasn't enough energy on the planet to have melted all of that ice in that amount of time. It's a paradox that geologists haven't really solved today when you're looking just purely at terrestrial sources. 
So what caused this massive melting, cooling, and then warming event in such a short period of time has always been something of a mystery. But in recent years, and in particular the last decade or so, scientists have put together a very compelling case that it was all due to a massive series of cosmic impacts and air bursts. What we've always been missing is a crater in these cases, right? Typically, when you're looking for a cosmic impact, you're looking first and primarily for a crater. As many of you will know, it looks like we've actually found that crater. But the work that's been happening in the last couple of decades has mostly been focused around sedimentary layer analysis, similar to ice cores, to tree rings that show growth, that show you a history. Sedimentary layers of the Earth them itself also gives us this type of a picture. It tells a story. And in these scientific papers, those layers of the Earth are called sedimentary sequences. And there's a very specific sedimentary sequence or a very specific layer that's found in many places around the world known as the Younger Dryas Boundary. And there's been lots of scientific papers that have been produced that have analysed this Younger Dryas Boundary layer. Mostly all of them have been based on locations in the Northern Hemisphere. You can find all of these papers at the cometresearchgroup.org website. In summary, they show what is known as impact proxies. And these proxies are just strong indicators that a cosmic impact occurred in this time frame. They aren't direct evidence of an impact in terms of things like a crater, but they are impact proxies that are highly suggestive of an impact. And inside these papers, you'll find evidence for things like high temperature impact spherules, which are microscopic iron and chromium balls, I guess, that can only be formed in these types of high impact and high temperature events. There's high levels of extraterrestrial platinum and gold, which is something that's typically found in comet or asteroid impacts. And you also have high concentrations of charcoal and a black matte layer that are indicators of just massive fires and biomass burning that occurred around this same Younger Dryas boundary time frame. And as I mentioned now, we also have evidence for a crater in Greenland. It's the Hiawatha crater. That is a crater that is under the ice. It looks like it does date back to this period. It could in fact be older. It does get discussed in this paper and we'll get into some of the details of that. And, and in in fact, in just recent months, a second crater has also been found in this area under the ice. So we have impact proxies, we have now what looks like a crater, and we have a lot of evidence supporting the Younger Dryas. All of that evidence to date, or most of it at least, has focused on the Northern Hemisphere. What's significant about this paper is that it really explores the Younger Dryas impact in the Southern Hemisphere. And it paints a frankly terrifying picture of what occurred. In some ways, it was almost worse than what occurred in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think this paper is extremely significant, which is why I wanted to do a video on it. So let's get into this paper. Reading from the abstract, quote, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis posits that fragments of a large disintegrating asteroid or comet struck North America, South America, Europe, and Western Asia around 12,800 years ago. Multiple air bursts and impacts produced the Younger Dryas boundary layer, depositing peak concentrations of platinum, high temperature spherules, melt glass, and nano diamonds, forming an isochronous datum at greater than 50 sites across roughly 50 million square kilometers of Earth's surface. This proposed event triggered extensive biomass burning, brief impact winter, Younger Dryas climate change, and contributed to extinctions of late Pleistocene megafauna. In the most extensive investigation south of the equator, we report on a 12,800-year-old sequence at Pilaco, Chile, roughly 40 degrees south, that exhibits peak Younger Dryas boundary concentrations of platinum, gold, high-temperature iron and chromium-rich spherules, and native iron particles rarely found in nature. A major peak in charcoal abundance marks an intense biomass burning episode, synchronous with dramatic changes in vegetation, including a high disturbance regime, seasonality in precipitation, and warmer conditions. This is antiphased with northern hemispheric cooling at the Younger Dryas onset, whose rapidity suggests atmospheric linkage. The sudden disappearance of megafaunal remains and dung fungi in the Younger Dryas boundary layer at Pilakio correlates with megafaunal extinctions across the Americas. The Pilakio record appears consistent with Younger Dryas boundary impact evidence found at sites on four continents. End quote. The basis for this paper is an analysis of a sedimentary sequence that has been dug up at a site called Palacio, which I'm sure I'm massacring the name, but Palacio in southern Chile. A sedimentary sequence is very similar to something like an ice core in that it's a, it's a layer cake of different results that correspond to different events and different time periods. And the, fur and the deeper you go into the earth, the further back in time you are going as well. What's interesting about this sequence is that it is very much in line or consistent with other sequences looking at the Younger Dryas boundary layer that have been unearthed in mostly the Northern Hemisphere but across four different continents. You also have the same indicators for megafaunal extinctions as well as indicators of just massive environmental and climate change. 
And an interesting aspect of that climate change that this paper explores briefly is the fact that it seems to be antiphased with the climate change that happened in the Northern Hemisphere. Northern Hemisphere, we had incredible temperature swings and dramatic cooling. But what happened in the Southern Hemisphere appears to be massive environmental changes. You had swings to you know, seasonality and pre precipitation, but you also had warming. So the environment changed dramatically, but it was the opposite of what happened in the Northern Hemisphere. And the rapidity of those changes, as well as the fact that it happened at the same time as the cooling in the Northern Hemisphere, is very suggestive of atmospheric processes linking the two. So this was absolutely a global event that had fallout all around the world. Before we get into the specific indicators in the sedimentary record, I wanted to quote something from section 11 of this paper, which is a description of the impact scenario. It's an overview of the cometary environment, the cosmic environment, if you like, and why this happened to the Earth, because I think this is an incredibly important point that has only really come into mainstream scientific attention in the last couple of decades. Quote, Section 11, Impact Scenario. The Younger Dryas Boundary Impact Event is argued to be the product of an astronomical environment that is discussed in detail in Wolbach et al., Summarizing that discussion, astronomical discoveries over the last few decades show that mass distribution of comets appear to be disproportionately large for bodies with diameters near and up to 300 kilometers, representing a greater hazard for Earth impacts. A 250 kilometer comet with a typical density of half a gram per cubic centimeter has 1,000 times the mass of the entire current near Earth asteroid system, so that Earth impacts from cometary material are more likely than from a similar sized asteroid. These large bodies drift into the near-Earth environment quite frequently in geological timescales, and in fact, the broad remains of two such bodies are present in the inner solar system today. One of them, the Torrid complex, is composed of debris from a roughly 100 km wide comet that arrived at least 20 to 30,000 years ago from the Centaur system of large comets, and then, further disintegrated hierarchically in a short period, Earth-crossing orbit there is a reasonable probability of one or more encounters within the last 13,000 years with debris storms from the Torrid complex or other large fragmented comets, and such an encounter would be hemispheric in scope, lasting for only a few hours. The resulting debris field would be a mixture of dust and larger fragments, potentially equivalent to the impact of roughly 1,000 to 10,000 destructive air bursts, such as occurred in Tunguska, Siberia in 1908. If such an event occurred at the Younger Dryas onset, Larger objects in the debris swarm could have created craters on land, struck the world's ice sheets, and or impacted the world's oceans, creating severe biotic and climatic disturbances. End quote. I think this section of the paper gets at the core of why we should all be collectively paying more attention to this work. In the past few decades, we have learned an awful lot more about the motions of the heavens and the risks of the occasional collision. We've learned that they happen much more frequently than we once thought they did, and therefore we're at a higher risk than we previously thought. Comets are very interesting cosmic bodies. Most of them are just as old as the rest of the solar system, if, if not older in fact. And there are literally billions, if not trillions of them, out in intersolar space in something called the Oort Cloud. We also have comets circling outside the solar system in a formation known as the Kuiper Belt. These comets are in a delicate but unstable orbit kind of like a boulder that's balanced at the very top of a hill with small forces that could push it in one direction or the other. Now occasionally these comets are pushed out of these orbits and they enter into our solar system. We think that this happens as a result of intergalactic forces, the alignment and gravitational forces coming from other solar systems and other large objects that are in our galaxy. And they can also be pulled in by gravitational forces that come from the very large planets in our solar system. For example, when our gas giants are in conjunction or alignment with the Sun. When this occurs, we find ourselves fortunate to be in the position of having a couple of large bounces at the door to the inner solar system. But these bounces are not really always that effective. Jupiter, Saturn and the other gas giants, they can fling these large comets back out of the solar system. Or in some cases, they can slow them down enough such that they enter into our inner solar system and they have the possibility to cross our own planet's orbit of the Sun. In these massive elliptical orbits, these comets begin to break up as they approach the Sun and heat up, and we can sometimes get spectacular and recurring views of them, like the Halley's Comet. And once they do break up, they form a debris stream, and this is more or less where our annual meteor showers come from. 
we cross the torrid meteor showers twice a year, which is the debris stream from Comet Enki. The risk comes from the fact that a single comet alone has much, much more mass than our own near-Earth asteroid system. And it is likely that there are still large chunks floating around in the debris streams they leave behind. Meteor showers are pretty spectacular to watch, but those debris streams can get a lot, a lot bigger than just a few bright streaks across a clear night sky. We have some concrete examples of just how this occurs. Some of you may recall when Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke up and impacted into Jupiter, as we all watched on breathlessly in 1994. The comet disintegrated into 21 or more chunks, some of them up to 2 kilometers in diameter, and they were moving at roughly 60 kilometers per second relative to Jupiter. This was a spectacular series of impacts. It's incredible that we even captured it on film. And some of the many visible impact blooms in the Jovian atmosphere were the size of our entire planet, and they remained visible in the gas giant's atmosphere for many months afterwards. By all indications, the Younger Dryas impact was the biggest thing to hit our planet in more than 5 million years, and in a geological timescale, it happened yesterday. Now while there have been a few notable impacts since, nothing has come close to the destruction that this unleashed on the planet. It is, simply put, the biggest risk to humanity's future. It's a true existential threat, and it's one that we should be all collectively paying more attention to. As a species, we can't do much about natural disasters, like flooding, earthquakes, volcanoes, or rapid changes in climate. On their own, none of these are a true threat to our species, although they could set us back a decade or so, they won't truly wipe us out. Cosmic impacts, however, do have that power. Not only do they cause the same natural disasters that I'm talking about, they impart so much energy into the planet that they represent nearly all of the true extinction level events that we know about. Yet at the same time, they're the one thing that we have some power to do something about, if, if we collectively put our back into it. If I were to describe a mission statement for this channel and what I'm trying to do, it's simply to spread this message, that we need to truly evaluate our priorities. Climate change is a political topic, and while lots of people are worrying about cows farting and they're slandering CO2 by calling it a pollutant, the reality is that our climate in the last 5,000 years has been in a period of unprecedented calm that the planet just has not witnessed in the last 500,000 years. And this is why our civilization has risen to the heights that it has, yet this period of calm will 100% come to an end someday. We should be using this opportunity wisely, but I fear that we're just too human for that in many ways. Our eyes are on each other, they're on our money, on the next election cycle, on our petty conflicts and our religions. They're certainly not looking up and into the stars. We pretend that the finite systems and resources of this planet are somehow infinite, all while the real threat to our existence looms out in the cosmic environment. This is the same cosmic environment that represents the real salvation for our species. It represents the only truly long-term solution for us, which is to both protect the planet from these impacts and to evolve and spread humanity into the stars. Call me old-fashioned if you like, but I don't think that many people retained this vision for the future of humanity, although just decades ago, we did. Now it's all about materialism competitions on Instagram, virtue signaling on Twitter, identity politics, endless cycles of celebrity culture and instant gratification. Not that I'm bitter about it, but just take a look at the trending tab on YouTube and see the type of stuff that is getting all the views. I haven't had regular TV for more than a decade, but every time I catch some of it, I'm astounded and shocked by its emptiness of meaningful content and the crass nature of advertising. I think even Edward Bernays would be rolling over in his grave. Hollywood has degenerated to nothing but committee-driven comic book movies and remakes of movies that have no need of remakes. They are flat out beating us over the head with the most basic of plots and writing, as if we're all too dumbed down to handle subtlety or complexity. And then they stuff the movie full of virtue signaling and postmodern identity politics. If you dare to complain about this, they just issue the catch call of our times. You're a racist. You're a sexist. You're clearly a white dude living in your mum's basement. The world seems full of inane, vapid, vulgar, and culturally corrosive content. And even a brief study of causes and factors involved with the downfall of civilizations will leave you with strong evidence that we're circling the drain, at least culturally speaking. Now, I've avoided these types of topics in my content, although I bother my friends and family endlessly about them, but it's something that I'm considering, as, at least to me, life seems like it should be about so much more than just this type of thing. 
True purpose, true love, and the satisfaction of a job well done are all things that require a long-term commitment, often years of effort and dedication. But it seems like these ideals are often being discarded for the temporary goals of being happy, as if suffering and sadness are now outside the bounds of the normal human condition. This is a dangerous fallacy, as it's only through the crucible of suffering that we can truly feel rewarded by success. The light at the end of the tunnel is only bright when it's compared to the darkness that we've been through. No matter how many likes you get for your food photos on Facebook, it's ultimately a hollow feeling. I think more and more people are becoming lost through the pressures and demands of modern culture and life. And feeling like something is wrong with you when you aren't happy, whatever happy is. We can live our lives with meaning and purpose. And in our modern high technology society that is slowly starting the journey into space, we have a collective opportunity to move our species forward and to guarantee its future. No humans before us have ever had this opportunity. And unless we grasp it, we will be inevitably knocked back into the Stone Age or just eliminated altogether the next time we cross paths with a decent sized chunk of iron that's floating around through space. Imagine if this was the message that was being given to children. This was the message being taught in schools. Perhaps we could inspire a whole new generation to reach for the stars, rather than reaching for a smartphone and a social media popularity contest that no one ever really wins. So that's enough grandstanding. If you like it, leave me a comment below if you think I should talk more about this type of thing in my content, or leave me a comment if you think I should just shut the hell up and get on with the history and science, which is what I'm going to attempt to do now. Back to the paper, and this is quoting from the introductory section. Quote, The Younger Dry's Boundary Impact Hypothesis posits that the hemisphere-wide debris field of a large phragmatic asteroid or comet struck Earth and caused brief impact winter conditions. In turn, this triggered major shifts in continental drainage patterns, dramatically changed oceanic circulation, and caused abrupt global climate changes, temperature and precipitation, marked by the Younger Dryas climactic episode in the Northern Hemisphere. The air bursts and impacts are proposed to have caused significant environmental changes, including widespread biomass burning, anomalously abrupt shifts in plant and animal distributions, human cultural changes and population declines, and broad extinctions within the iconic late Pleistocene megafauna. Studies of the Younger Dryas boundary layer report peak abundances of a diverse suite of proposed cosmic impact-related proxies at more than 50 sites located mostly within the Northern Hemisphere, but with two previous sites in the Southern Hemisphere, Venezuela and Antarctica. These include peak abundances of high temperature high iron spherules, glassy silica rich spherules, high temperature melt glass, nano diamonds, platinum, iridium, osmium and or other impact related proxies. The Younger Dryas boundary layer is also often marked by abundance peaks in biomass burning proxies, including charcoal, acinoform carbon and soot, carbon spherules, glass-like carbon and or combustion aerosols. This entire suite of proxies at the Younger Dryas onset is argued to represent one of the largest known biomass burning peaks of the late Quaternary. End quote. One thing to note here is that the Quaternary refers to the last 500,000 to about a million years ago, suggesting that this was the largest fire we've seen in a million years as a result of this event. The paper briefly mentions here the effect on human populations in terms of cultural changes and population declines. Obviously, that's a very important aspect to what happened during the Younger Dryas. It's one of the aspects to our own history that I'm particularly interested in. Because at this point, only some 12,800 years ago, unarguably there were modern humans all over the planet. And the question is whether or not we had risen to some form of high civilization before this catastrophe happened, because the more you read about the Younger Dryas and the more you understand about the extent of the cataclysm that occurred here, the more it seems plausible that whatever was on the surface of the earth in a lot of these areas, certainly a lot of the areas that people would have thrived in terms of coastal regions, equatorial regions, places that were warm during the end of the last ice age, those were the places of the earth that were most hardest hit by this cataclysm, particularly anything in North America got wiped out. The next section of the paper is interesting because it deals with some of the arguments against the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. The Comet Research Group has always actively addressed the criticisms of their theory. In fact, their website lists not only the papers that are for the impact hypothesis, but also all the papers that are against it. 
and they have actually written other peer-reviewed papers that directly address some of the criticisms of this impact hypothesis, and they continue to do so in papers like this. Quote, First proposed in 2007, the younger Dreis boundary impact hypothesis is still controversial a decade later because a number of independent studies have raised questions about the proposed younger Dreis boundary impact event. It was argued in several studies that individual impact indicators are also produced by non-impact processes, thus not requiring an impact. Proponents of the Younger Dryas Boundary Impact Hypothesis concede that individual proxies might have formed through alternative processes, but argue that coeval abundance peaks for the entire suite of proxies in the same stratum is unique to cosmic impact events. Impact proponents argue that the Younger Dryas Boundary datum layer is precisely equivalent in age to the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling episode recorded in the Greenland Ice Sheet and in many other stratigraphic sections of the Northern Hemisphere. End quote. So what's interesting to me is that this gets at some of the arguments against the comet impact theory that I've heard. In particular, the one that I'm familiar with is Robert Schock and the theory of coronal mass ejections or CMEs coming from the sun. These are periods of intense thermal activity that could potentially make some of these other impact proxies like the high temperature melt glass and things like that. The Comet Research Group is arguing here that it's the actual collection of all of the impact proxies together that makes it unique to cosmic impacts, and that seems consistent. They do talk about the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the KT boundary here, that was the one that killed off all the dinosaurs. It's roughly 65 and a half million years ago. That forms a data layer in the Earth that has the same suite of proxies in it. Moving on in the paper, we get into a discussion of the newly discovered Hiawatha Crater in Greenland. Although the crater is technically as yet undated, the authors do discuss their reasoning behind why they think it's likely that the crater dates to the Younger Dryas time frame. Quote, an important new development includes the discovery by Kaya and others of a giant 31 kilometer wide, possibly Younger Dryas boundary aged impact crater under the Hiawatha Glacier in northwestern Greenland, calculated to have been produced by a 1.5 kilometer wide impactor. Kaya and others conclude that the potential age range of the impact event spans the Younger Dryas onset, although the crater is as yet undated. The potential for a Younger Dryas boundary age is based on several lines of evidence. One. Post Younger Dryas boundary annual ice layers are present from the Younger Dryas, 12,800 to 11,700 years before present, through the Holocene, 11,700 years before present to modern times, but undisturbed pre Younger Dryas boundary ice layers are missing. 2. There is evidence of hydrothermal activity within the crater beneath the overlying 930 metre thick ice sheet, as would be expected from residual heat generated by Young impact. 3. The subglacial crater rim and basin appear relatively fresh and minimally eroded, consistent with a young crater. 4. Kaya and others report platinum group element anomalies in the crater derived from an extraterrestrial impact event. This is similar to the results of Pataev and others, who analysed Greenland ice and reported an abundance peak in platinum spanning 21 years from 12,836 to 12,815 years before present. Kaya and others conclude that such a massive impact event, quote, very likely had significant environmental consequences in the Northern Hemisphere and possibly globally, end quote. If so, this impact event may have triggered climate change in southern Chile, which we explore in this contribution, end quote. There are a couple of interesting aspects of that discussion to me. In particular, it's the fact that you have ice layers that have been laid down after the Younger Dryas boundary event in this area, but you have nothing, no ice before the Younger Dryas event. So this seems pretty likely that it dates the crater to about the Younger Dryas event, seeing as you do have in other parts of Greenland glaciers that go back much further than that. And they also show you the results of one of the ice core studies, which is Pataev and others. They analyze the Greenland ice and you can get an indication of just how accurate scientists are becoming when they analyze ice core samples. In this case, it gives you an exact date of the platinum peaks that were spanned from 12,836 to 12,815 years. So a very short period of time to lay down a really abundant peak in platinum shows you the rapidity of the Younger Dryas impact event. And by the way, uh, platinum group element, or PGE, as you can see in the document, that just refers to the platinum group elements. It's things like platinum, palladium, osmium, uh, a few other elements. I think there's six of them in them, but those are typically found in and around extraterrestrial impacts and cosmic impacts. Before we get into a discussion of the results of this paper and their specific findings, I wanted to take a quick break to provide a bit of a channel update and also to thank some people. 
So if you don't want to hear that, feel free to skip forward a little bit to the parts where you don't hear the background music. But in terms of the channel, I've been a little busy outside of my YouTube work. I don't know if some of you may know, but I live on a, uh, on a small farm and spring has most definitely sprung here in Northern California. So I've been really busy with the rains backing off and I've had a lot of things to do outside of creating these videos. All of my videos tend to take an awful lot of time because of the amount of editing that goes into them. I do have a lot more planned. I will absolutely be finishing the Serapium series. I have the final chapter of that in the works. I also have my second episode of the Cataclysms of the Ice Age where we get into all of the different evidence supporting these cataclysms. This, this video itself kind of fits into that category a little bit. I also have a number of other projects in the pipeline, although I'd love to hear any suggestions or any feedback from any, any of you that have particular sites or particular things you'd be interested in me taking a look at. But I do want to take an in-depth look at a number of different sites, particularly in Egypt, to the same extent that I have done on the Serapium. But there is certainly a lot more to come on Uncharted X. So as you know, if you've seen any of my videos, I try to run this channel on a value for value model. It's a concept that I lifted straight from one of my favorite podcasts, the No Agenda Show. But it essentially goes like this, that if you get any value from my work, it would be highly appreciated if you can return some of that value to me. Now, that doesn't have to be monetary support, although that is always appreciated. It may just be in terms of feedback. It might be in terms of sharing my channel or sending this to other people so that we can grow the audience and we can spread the message a little further. I do have some specific individuals I'd like to thank that have been supporting me directly, in particular on Patreon. There's a number of people that have signed up to my Patreon account. I'm extremely thankful for these folks. Uh, first and foremost, my good friend Fred Soria. He's been an amazing support throughout this channel. Fred uh, jumped right over all of the different tiers that I'd set up in Patreon and went straight to a $50 a month level, which is extremely generous. It's almost too generous of him. But I'm ex really thankful for his support, so thanks, Fred. Also, Andrew Finnick, he runs the Ancient History Criticisms channel on YouTube. He goes into great depth looking at megalithic architecture and ancient sites. If you like that sort of thing, I'd highly recommend checking out his channel. And I'm also very grateful for his continued support. In the same vein as Andrew is Ian Gifford. Ian Gifford has been a great supporter of my work here, as well as the work on the Pukajay channel. Ian's always been very vocal in the support, and he's signed up to support me on Patreon. So thanks, Ian. And also Kevin Hickey, as well as Touch Border, are also a couple of folks that have signed up to support me on Patreon. It's a small crowd initially at this point, but it's it, they're all of these people I'm really grateful to. Your support means an awful lot to me, and it means I can continue trying to put the effort in to create these videos, because it seems like there is an audience for it, so thank you. I am also set up on Subscribestar if you're over Patreon for any number of reasons that people get over Patreon. I don't have anybody supporting me on Subscribestar. You can only set a single price on Subscribestar. I think I've set it at like $2.99 a month or something like that. If anybody doesn't like Patreon but, but wants an alternative, Subscribestar is out there. And I'd really like to thank the people that also support me through PayPal. So the value for value model in terms of tipping a server or the price of a cup of coffee or even the price of a movie that seems to work for people if they get value from a specific piece of content. You can use PayPal. They take a very low cut of any of the contributions as opposed to people like Patreon. It's a really efficient way to show your support and to help me produce the show directly. So I'd like to give a huge thank you and a shout out to the following people that have supported me through PayPal. Anders Dahlstrom has sent me in a couple of donations on the back of videos. Thank you, Anders. As has Oliver Ayres, send in a couple of different donations on the back of a couple of different videos. Farzad Najat, Christian Lingua, Linda Rainey, John Newman, thank you guys. A couple of people I'd like to call out in particular. Curtis Frost, Curtis has sent in a couple of generous donations and most recently also sent me a really nice note through the PayPal interface. The note said, I'll continue to send support to you, Ben. I really hope to see you succeed with your Uncharted X endeavors because you're doing a phenomenal job and it's really important work. So thank you very much, Curtis. I really appreciate the vote of confidence there. That, that helps me a whole a whole lot. Also, I really want to send a thank you, thank you to Cortez Studios. I think it's Dave at Cortez Studio. He uh, sent in a donation of $100, which just you know blew my mind, particularly with where my channel is at. It was It really made my day. So thanks, Dave. I really appreciate that vote of confidence. That was extremely generous of you. Uh, also, I recently received a donation from Hank Nordstrom over at 
Turnitin and Turner. Now, Hank has an interesting little story and we had a conversation on my website in the comments section. Hank had, on the back of the Serapium series of videos, booked himself a trip to Egypt and went over and spent some time with Yusuf. And he's come back with a whole bunch of questions. He's actually a CNC machinist, exactly the kind of person that I'd be interested in talking to about what they saw in terms of the machining that you can find in Egypt. And he has sent me a lot of questions around what I think the origin story is and what I think really happened on some of these sites. So Hank, if you're listening, thank you for the note. Thank you for the donation. I will absolutely get around to answering those questions in terms of putting together an overall theory and speculation on what I think has happened. That is something that I have planned in the works. It's something that I've been writing for quite a while. It may not be a short video, but it's one that I am planning to uh, produce at some point in the future. So thank you to everyone that has supported me. I really do appreciate it. If you would like to support me, you can find all the details to do so on unchartedx.com slash support. You know, without this support, it's, it makes it much harder for me to continue doing this work. I'm trying to get as much of my time into it as I can, and the more support I get means the more time I can put into making these videos and making this content. So again, thank you to everybody that has signed up to support me. All right, back to the paper. I want to get into the meat of their results and their discussion because I think it paints a very clear picture of what occurred at this part of planet Earth during the Younger Dryas. I'm only going to quote selectively from the document. I will summarize a lot of the findings. As I said before, if you want to find my copy of this paper where I've highlighted and marked up the relevant sections of it, you can find it on unchartedx.com. But they took an extremely comprehensive approach to analyzing this sedimentary record at this site. Quote, the Chilean Council of National Monuments has protected the unique Palaukyo site as an important paleontological and archaeological resource because of its rich and abundant assemblage of extinct South American Pleistocene mammals and cultural remains. In this study, we conducted time series material analysis across the sedimentary sequence to determine changes in concentrations of platinum, palladium, high temperature magnetic spherules, charcoal, plant macrofossils, pollen, and dung fungal spores. Also, the Palakio stratigraphic sequence has provided an unprecedented opportunity to compare the regional megafaunal extinctions at high resolution with similar coeval extinctions in the Northern Hemisphere. We have also undertaken quantitative pollen and seed analysis across the boundary layer for paleoclimatic and paleo-environmental assessments and for comparison with Younger Dryas climatic change as determined from sequences in the Northern Hemisphere. It is important to note that the main objective of this contribution is to test the Younger Dryas boundary hypothesis and to document and discuss the wide range of evidence found within the Palakio sedimentary section in southern Chile. In this study, we sought to determine whether the evidence at Palakio is consistent or inconsistent with the Younger Dryas boundary impact hypothesis and to explore the potential consequences of the proposed impact event, end quote. So no prizes for guessing which way they went. Obviously, the results of this study are extremely consistent with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. This study covers all possible angles of the Younger Dryas boundary event. From the microscopic metallic spherules of the impact fallout itself, to the analysis of charcoal and carbon layers that indicate the follow-on massive biomass burning, to a detailed investigation of organic remains that shows the devastating climate change that occurred and the specific effect this event had on the environment and the flora, and also to human populations and the megafauna of the region and the time. Chemical and scanning electron microscope analysis of the microscopic spherules found in the Younger Dryas boundary layer at Palakio show a couple of interesting features. Their texturing indicates high temperature melting of iron that occurred at greater than 1450 degrees C, followed by a rapid quenching, along with indications of a lack of oxygen as they formed. So this was quite a violent and a high temperature event. Consider the hypothesis stated earlier that this event occurred some 12,800 years ago when our planet crossed the wrong section of the Torrid Media Stream, which is the broken up remains of a massive 200 kilometer plus diameter comet. There was a huge swarm of impacts and air bursts, mostly centered in the Northern Hemisphere, and it lasted only a few hours, but it massively changed the surface of the planet. Experts speculate that there must have been between 1,000 and 10,000 Tunguska-like events in this short time. Tunguska was a cosmically very small airburst and an explosion that occurred in 1908 over Russia. Yet, small as it was, it flattened some 2,000 square kilometers of forests like they were matchsticks. 
I mean, this is the equivalent of a 15 kiloton nuclear bomb, and that's 1,000 times greater than the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. So along with these air bursts that happened, again, just in these few hours, you also have the impacts of larger bodies, bodies like the 1.5 kilometer sized rock that caused the Hiawatha Crater, which is some 31 miles in diameter, or 31 kilometers. Also, the likely impact to the ice of the Great Lakes region, uh, that caused the Carolina Bays as fallout damage. It's almost impossible to truly imagine the violence of this event and the follow-on effects that it had on the planet. So these microscopic particles, they melted and they cooled in these explosions. The fact that many of them didn't oxidize fully due to the oxygen deficient conditions gives you some idea of the pressures and the heat of these explosions. These particles are almost impossible to produce in nature. Similar melt glass and particles have been produced by atomic bomb testing sites. So we understand how they're formed and they're not the result of any natural or terrestrial process. These particles were injected back up into the atmosphere and they fell more or less all around the world to be later found by these types of dedicated scientists in the Younger Dryas boundary sedimentary layer. The authors of the paper spend some time discussing possible alternative sources for these types of spherules, most notably volcanic sources, and ultimately they dismiss these as extremely unlikely, as even the largest known eruption in the last 5 million years which is the 75,000 year old Toba Lake eruption. That distributed material up to 2,500 kilometers from its caldera. Even that eruption didn't produce any spherules of this type. There has been some debate on the science surrounding the Younger Dryas boundary spherules specifically. And to be honest, some of it borders on being disingenuous. I mean, scientific work of this type is often controversial, but the ideas being put forth in the cosmic impact hypothesis have absolutely massive implications. And it's not just implications for the strictly academic fields that are on display in the paper. This should have a huge impact to the study of history, of human civilizations, of what real climate change means. It should impact studies into paleoanthropology and archaeology the distribution of populations and of what happened to the hordes of megafauna and Pleistocene species that suddenly just disappeared from the record. There's a great deal of academic and mainstream resistance to the cataclysm concept, and that in itself is really nothing new. Geology itself, for more than 60 years during the 19th century, had a stated mandate to use uniformitarianism and gradualism to explain the features that we see around us, in an effort to distance itself from the church and from the popular concept of catastrophism that was touted by religion. These concepts are still part of mainstream scientific literature and in the textbooks today, yet there's a very slow correction that's occurring as we begin to realize that the concept of cataclysms and catastrophes that are preserved by nearly every culture on the planet and their religions seems to be correct, at least in principle, if not in specific details. The mainstream really does not want to admit that this giant world-changing disaster actually happened. It's as if it's somehow challenging the very principles upon which Western civilization is constructed and that we are somehow infallible in our purpose, that we are the result of a direct linear progression of technology that came right from the Stone Age. I mean, if you haven't fully considered the idea, it can be a little jarring when you first begin to realize that this isn't the case, that we're just on the latest cycle of the hamster wheel of civilization, and that there's a very good chance we've been built up to heights of civilization in the distant past, only to be knocked down so violently and so thoroughly by cosmic forces that there are barely even any clues left to us today to piece together. I mean, all we have are fragments of a shared precursor civilization. They're left to us through megalithic architecture, through the varied myths and ancient religions that encode sacred geometry and knowledge of the heavens. This concept is challenging, but it seems like many in the orthodox mainstream are just not willing to consider it. The spirit of that inertia to new and disruptive thinking, like the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, comes through in some of the so-called scientific work intended to debunk this cosmic impact theory. The Comet research team has addressed these criticisms and they continue to do so in this paper. In particular, they address the studies centering on the microscopic spherules that attempt to show that they aren't actually impact related. In case I hadn't made it clear, these are tiny, tiny particles. To understand the nuances, you really need to use a scanning electron microscope. Now this is a little technical, but essentially the authors here are saying that these studies that criticize their work either didn't use a scanning electron microscope at all, or they might have even deliberately fudged the results to make the impact spherules appear as if they are the same as other types of particles, which they are most definitely not. Quote, Summary of Independent Younger Dryas Boundary Spheral Investigations this paper describes in detail multiple types of spheroletic objects including orthogenic, volcanic, detrital, 
framboidal, and younger driest boundary spherules. And supplementary table S8 summarizes a number of the unique and distinguishing characteristics of each type. Numerous other investigations have shown that these various particles cannot be differentiated using reflected light microscopy, but require the use of scanning electron microscopes as originally specified by Firestone and others. Of 13 subsequent independent studies, all claim to have followed the Firestone protocols, but only eight studies correctly performed scanning electron microscope analysis, and all eight confirmed the results of Firestone and others. Five of the 13 studies reported that younger driest boundary spherules are distributed in non-younger driest boundary layers throughout the sediment investigated, and therefore cannot be impact related. However, these five studies either did not conduct scanning electron microscopes at all, or did not correctly differentiate younger driest boundary spherules from non-younger driest boundary spherulitic objects, such as volcanic spherules, framboids, and detrital grains. These disparate results, some from studies using the same sedimentary profiles, clearly emphasize the necessity of performing scanning electron microscope analysis. End quote. Section 5 of the report details the evidence for extensive biomass burning that occurred directly at the onset of the Younger Dryas, as the team found evidence for hundreds of years of massive and raging fires that very likely caused impact winter light conditions and would have made life extremely difficult for anything running around trying to find food at the time, as evidenced by the massive extinctions that went along with this roughest of days. Charcoal, carbon spherules, and soot are all heavily embedded in the very same sedimentary layers that show peaks in extraterrestrial platinum and the Younger Dryas boundary spherules, indicating that yes, the world was mostly set on fire as a result of this cosmic strike. The scale of these fires is like nothing we have ever witnessed before, and it's very hard to imagine what 10% of the world being on fire actually looks like. Not only that, but the initial impact and airburst related fires are entirely different beasts to regular wildfires or to the firestorms that we are somewhat accustomed to in places like Australia or California that, that seem to happen each year. A phenomena occurs when large cosmic bodies enter our atmosphere at high temperatures. They are likely to be off-gassing tremendous amounts of catalytic and combustible gases and compounds, such that if you were unlucky enough to be anywhere near these events, it might appear as if the very air itself was on fire. There are a couple of fires in our history that seem likely to have been caused by these types of things. Fires that share some common factors, like a sickly purple tinge to the air, or the fact that the world seemed to go silent before the onslaught of fire began. One of these events was the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, in which eyewitness reports state that the atmosphere itself seemed to catch fire, and that tunnels of flame would leap down blocks of buildings and set entire buildings alight in a single instant. Another fire was the Great Forest Fire of our time, the Miramichi Fire of 1825 on the eastern coast of the United States, in which some two million acres were almost instantly torched, and in a matter of three minutes, every single house in two towns in the area was burning. People said that spouts of fire rained down onto treetops, that the entire sky was alight in a sheet of flame. And you've got to remember, these were people that were used to living in nature. It was 1825. They were living in a forest. They were presumably quite used to the concept of occasional and natural wildfires. Both the Chicago and the Miramichi fire, although they were separated by 50 years, they both occurred in October, which is during the period in which we crossed the toroid media stream. There was nothing natural about these events. At Miramichi, it was said that you couldn't walk through the region afterwards without stepping on dead animals and dead game. The acreage burnt is equivalent to the entire acreage of the worst years of Californian or Australian bushfires that burned in an entire season, all being burned up in a single day. I mean, there are even records of a Chinese city in the 15th century being utterly destroyed overnight as a result of a cosmic impact. It's just a different kind of event to the fires that we're accustomed to. Yet even these relatively modern and massively destructive events can't hold a candle, which is a pun that's intended, to the roaring infernos that would have been created by the Younger Dryas. For a long period of time after this event, if you had somehow managed to live through it, it would indeed have seemed like the world had ended. I mean, which in effect, as far as humans and animal life was concerned, it really had. Randall Carlson has made an excellent study of these events. As always, I highly recommend his Geocosmic Rex channel. To anyone that really wants to get into the nitty gritty details, I guarantee you there's more Randall than you can handle on that channel. So as you might imagine, this event and these fires and everything else that happened severely affected plant life. And indeed, it changed the entire climate of the planet quite dramatically. The evidence for pre-younger driest plants after the boundary layer almost entirely disappear from the record, 
And for hundreds of years afterwards, plant life in general was a full seven times less abundant than before the Younger Dryas. A dramatic and immediate reduction to both the abundance and the diversity of plant life happened. Indeed, it now appears that the climate itself shifted dramatically in these regions as a result of the Younger Dryas event. Quote, All of these factors indicate that the post-Younger Dryas boundary vegetation at Palacio is closely affiliated with the more northern Valdivian rainforest that favours seasonally drier and warmer conditions. As such, the vegetation history at Palacio records a sudden shift at the Younger Dryas boundary from cooler, wetter conditions, characteristic of the North Patagonian forest, to seasonally drier and warmer conditions of the Valdivian rainforest. Coinciding with the termination of the Atlantic cold reversal, this shift in vegetation at the Younger Dryas boundary continued for at least 100 years, suggesting persistent post-Younger Dryas boundary climate change and a disturbed landscape. End quote. The change that occurred in the southern hemisphere appears to be the opposite of that which happened in the north. The north underwent dramatic cooling, while there was a warming spike that happened in the south. The climate of our planet is incredibly complex. It has been stable for millions of years, and there are also likely thousands upon thousands of interconnected systems that drive it across both our atmosphere and our oceans. What seems clear to me is that the climate was savagely disrupted by the Younger Dryas event, and the effects around the globe were almost immediate, suggesting atmospheric linkage, as oceanic changes simply take longer to show their effects, although they were absolutely a component, as ocean currents were massively disrupted by the huge influx of meltwater from the flooding that occurred, as the ice sheets were pretty much smashed. It's suggested that this altered the salinity levels of the ocean, it disrupted the conveyor belt-like system of ocean currents, and that the warm equatorial winds, which are known as the trade winds, shifted south, and that drove the warming of the southern hemisphere, even as the glaciers and the sea ice in the north expanded rapidly and the overall temperatures of the world dropped dramatically. So despite the overall global cooling that happened, the oceans during this time were marked by an enigmatic and abrupt rise in mean temperature that continued for roughly some 700 years. This rise in ocean temperature buries the needle relative to the tiny and frankly inconsequential amounts of warming that have been recorded in modern times from 1971 to 2005. This is a very complex and confusing system, but put in the context of a cosmic impact, it becomes a little less so as we continue to peel back the onion on the true climate history of our planet. Quote, The evidence suggests that a seemingly enigmatic chain of interconnected oceanic and atmospheric circulation changes caused the Younger Dryas climactic episode to be expressed simultaneously in both the northern and southern hemispheres. These changes were marked by anomalous timing and by the character and magnitude of changes in continental meltwater plumbing, accompanied by major shifts in atmospheric and oceanic circulation. We posit that the Younger Dryas Boundary Cosmic Impact event, possibly resulting in the Hiawatha Crater, triggered these processes and that they appear less enigmatic in the context of a cosmic impact triggering mechanism. End quote. As far as the impact to both animal and human life at the time, the findings are quite clear. It was devastating. The research team looked at both megafauna and human remains in the strata as well as the levels of spores that come from the fungi that occur naturally in the droppings of large animals. To summarise the findings, populations of megafauna were large and robust, in fact they were at their peak just prior to the Younger Dryas, and then any indications of large animals just completely disappears directly at the Younger Dryas boundary. It has been suggested that more than 80% of the large mammals over 44 kilograms in South America were made extinct, as a direct result of this event, which is just a mind-boggling number. Altogether, South America lost more of its Pleistocene genera and species than did North America, Asia, or Europe. Evidence of human occupation appeared closely tied to the megafaunal record, indicating that they relied on them probably as a food source, and they too disappeared from the record at this time, suggestive either of a migration, or more likely, the humans suffered the same fate as did the other large mammals, a massive and very dire reduction in population. Quote, Spacing analysis shows that megafaunal populations peaked at roughly 12,810 to 12,780 years before present, followed by a large abrupt decline in their populations beginning at or near the Younger Dryas onset. Subsequently, small populations of some taxa persisted, also to decline and to become extinct during the Younger Dryas and Early Holocene. 
These data closely match the results of the summed probability analysis and overlap with the age range of 12,835 to 12,735 years before present for the proposed Younger Dryas boundary impact event. End quote. Overall, this paper has succeeded in what it set out to do, which is to test the known factors and effects of the Younger Dryas event in the Southern Hemisphere. From impact proxies to evidence for wildfires to the extinction of the megafauna and the decline of human populations, the paper confirms everything that has been painstakingly unearthed about the Younger Dryas period in the Northern Hemisphere. To quote from the paper's conclusion section, quote, Section 12, Conclusions. The main objective of this study was to test the Younger Dryas boundary impact hypothesis by analysing a wide range of data from the Palacio site in southern Chile. The following conclusions show that our data and interpretations are consistent with the Younger Dryas boundary impact hypothesis, and we found no evidence that refutes the hypothesis. In summary, evidence has been found in the Palacio section that is similar to that found at more than 50 Younger Dryas boundary sites on four continents. This is the first time that extensive Younger Dryas boundary evidence has been found at high latitudes in the Southern Hemisphere. The evidence reported in this study appears consistent with the proposed effects of a Younger Dryas boundary cosmic impact event that affected both the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. End quote. I think this work is incredibly important and its findings should drive home the unbelievable scale and impact of the Younger Dryas. I want to commend the research team and the Comet Research Group for their efforts here, and I hope that in some small way I've helped to spread their message and to drive some more interest towards their work. In the past decade, they have built a new and somewhat alarming picture of our past. It's a picture that should have tremendous impact to everything we think we know about the roots of our own species, the rise of civilizations, and the true climate history of our planet. I think if more people were aware of this and took an interest, we might actually stand a chance to be better prepared the next time the cosmic reset button comes around. Because believe it, it's coming. It might not be for some time, or it might be tomorrow, but undeniably, we have evidence that it's been pushed many times before on our planet. And each time that this happens, everything shifts. I think if more people understood the true history of our planet, and the fact that we're basically still recovering from the last real hit, it might put some context to the term climate change, and it might even help us to align our priorities as a species that is limited to one single rock. I like to think of it as an organic spaceship, but it's one single rock. And it's a rock that's hurtling through a cosmic environment that every so often gives us a reminder that it's out there, and it shows us just how truly vulnerable we really are. Despite this, our opportunity to address it is unprecedented, it's an opportunity that is only available to us as a result of thousands of years of nice, calm weather and thousands of years of technological growth. I truly, truly hope that we reach out and grasp it, because if we don't, we might never get the chance again. This is Ben. You've been listening to Uncharted X. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the channel. Check me out on unchartedx.com. And if you'd like to support me, unchartedx.com support.